hey, this is the one before the last. And uh, I believe now we can breed because we've passed the most difficult segments. So we are heading toward light. And I'm glad you're back. Let's pray and let's go. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for one more time when we can just sit together a little bit, reason together, learn from you, and get a deeper understanding of what is happening and what is going to happen. We pray that you will guide us through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me explain a little bit what I have here on the board first, and then we are going there. These three things here, these three lines here, are the three angels carrying the gospel. In Revelation chapter 12, then 13 and 14, we have the whole drama of the great controversy. And we've seen that there is a final proclamation of the gospel through the three angels that come from here, from this section here. And this section is about the victory of the Lamb and of the 144,000, those that overcome the beast. They are celebrating their victory on Mount Zion. And Right here, the three angels go with their proclamation. After the three angels' message, in chapter 14, all we have is the harvest of the grain and the harvest of the grapes. This is the harvest of the faithful. And this is the harvest of the wicked. So we have two different kind of harvests. But we don't have details with regard to the process, how all this thing is playing out. Then we've seen, starting with chapter 15, that at the beginning of uh, this section here, section 5, which is parallel to section 3, Section 5 is the seven plagues. Section 3 is the seven trumpets. Here, right at the beginning, we have the moment when the sanctuary service ceases. That's why I have a, a little altar with incense going up, but I exit out. And when that happens, the seven plagues are poured out. In the process of the seven plagues, we have a critical moment right here when Babylon is in view and we are told that the river Euphrates dries up so that the kings from east can come. And that is a very interesting language which speaks about something similar to what happened in history when Cyrus overcame Babylon, when he got into the city through the dry bed of the river Euphrates. So here is the moment when Jesus' second coming is already in preparation. Because he is not coming yet. But the river of Euphrates is drying up to prepare the way for him to come. So, right here, we are very close to the moment when Jesus Christ appears. And uh, I don't know how to paint a horse, but here somewhere, we should have a horse. It has a tail too. So, Jesus 
Christ comes back. So now we are going on with the reading of the text and we try to pick up the history or the story of uh, chapter 19, see where it starts, okay? So let's go to this section here. We are at the section number six, the final victory. Section six, parallels section two, and uh, I will point out later why that is important. And as you can see here, we are right before the end section. So we are trying now to see where we can pick up the story. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. We don't know yet where to pick up the story. But then it says, For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot. Who's the great harlot? What's the name of the harlot? Babylon. Okay. The great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Remember in chapter 17, the great harlot was drunk with the blood of the saints. So here, God avenges on her the blood of his servants shed by her. So right here, we are helped to pick up the story because the harlot is Babylon. And the moment we are being presented with is when the great harlot is judged. When is that moment when the great harlot is judged? Right here, in the sixth plague. So I put B here because Babylon is being judged. In the language of chapter 16 and then 17, Babylon falls apart into three parts. And when that happens, it says here, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. So this is an important moment because God reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His wife has made herself ready. So this is a moment when God omnipotent, the Lord God omnipotent reigns. We've seen before, in chapter 11, there was a moment when he started reigning. And that moment was right here, when he started reigning. But it wasn't very visible yet. The moment that is in view here, when he, God, the Lord God Omnipotent reigns, is when Jesus Christ appears. Meaning, it has to be here, where I have the horse. Where do I have the horse? Well, first, Babylon is destroyed, and then I have the horse. But let's see what is happening here. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. Remember that Bible verse in John chapter 14 where Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. You know how it continues? Believe in God, believe in me, in my Father's house. 
there are many mansions or many rooms and I'm going to prepare a room, a place for you. That language is the same language that we find here. In what way? Because the whole relationship between Jesus Christ and us is described in the language of a wedding. Jesus Christ came when he was born in Bethlehem so that he can engage us to himself. He came to do the engagement. According to the wedding procedures or traditions of those times, when somebody wanted to marry somebody, a boy, marry a girl, then he would go to the girl's house, to the girl's father's house, and after making those arrangements there, getting an agreement from the father, the boy, the young man, would go home and prepare the place for the next step when he would bring the bride home. So what Jesus did when he came for the first time, when he was born in Bethlehem, and he even died for us, he came to engage us to himself. The Apostle Paul even uses this language. And then the next step would be to present us to the Father, to take us home to his Father's house where he is preparing places for us. So here, the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. So this is the moment when Jesus, the groom, the bridegroom, comes back, and the bride is ready. After he had already prepared places in his father's house. Okay? But the question is, who is the bride? Who is his wife? God's people, of course. Originally, we've seen in chapter 12, there was a beautiful, shiny woman. A woman that was supposed to be the bride of the Lamb. And at one point, the dragon trying to destroy the woman, she is taken, she is given two wings of a great eagle, and she flies into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. You would expect that in the wilderness there, the woman would stay faithful to the lamb, waiting for the lamb to come back and take her home to his father's house. So that's the story. But something weird happens because later when John is carried away in the spirit by one of the angels, most probably the angel of the sixth plague, because that's the angel that deals with Babylon. John is taken to the wilderness. And in the wilderness, he sees a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. So instead of seeing a shiny woman that still is the bride of the Lamb, he sees a woman riding a scarlet beast, which is a political persecuting power, and she herself is drunk with the blood of the saints. Which means that the woman that used to be the bride of the Lamb, by and large, became the lover of the beast. So the point is, you have two stages of the woman. In the Old Testament, that can be seen very clearly. You have Israel, when Israel is faithful to God, 
And then you have Israel when Israel is no more faithful to God. And out of the Israel that is no more faithful to God, no longer faithful to God, a remnant only stays faithful to God. And only a remnant goes back to Canaan after Cyrus comes and uh, enters Babylon and lets God's people go home. Okay? And that's what you have in Revelation chapter 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest. And this is the word for remnant. The rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So these are those that are portrayed here as the wife ready to receive the groom coming back. And to her it was granted, and please notice this, she is ready, we are told first, and his wife has made herself ready, she has made herself ready, but how? And to her it was granted. So please notice that something is granted to her. She is not getting ready by her own power, wearing her own clothes. And this is another way of speaking about righteousness by faith. It was granted to her to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. This is the same language that you can find in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for instance, where we are told, and we are his handiwork or masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to walk in the good works that God prepared for us beforehand so that we can walk in them. Clean and bright, for the linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And this is granted to the woman. This is not her own garment. So practically, the bride wears a garment, a wedding dress, offered to her. Offered to her by whom, you may ask? Uh, by the groom himself. Because it's his righteousness through which we can go home. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we have a picture of a supper. Do you remember when Jesus knocks at the door at the end of history in the Laodicean segment of church history? Why is he knocking at the door? Maybe, maybe somebody will allow him in. So, so what? To do what? Ah, to have supper. See how the language adds up? Called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you have the same language in chapter 17, 14. These will make war with the Lamb, that is those that are on the side of the beast. And the Lamb will overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. So those are the wife. Those are the bride of the Lamb. Now I saw heaven open, says John, and behold a white horse. Ah, so now, now you know why the horse is here. So practically, we are here when the horse, more precisely the knight sitting on the horse, is coming back. You know, this is a, a light motive in all those fairy tales where the prince or the knight riding that white horse comes to take the bride to his kingdom. Right? 
But this is what is very important to notice. A white horse appears, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. We know who he is, right? It's pretty obvious who is the one that sits on the horse. But watch this. He is sitting on the white horse. Prior in the book of Revelation, we saw a succession of four horses, the first being white. Where are the rest? Where is the red, the black, the pale? We never see them again. Because the only horse that comes out in the end, because this is somewhere here at the beginning of the history of Christianity, and the white horse coming back is right here at the end. The only horse that comes back is the white horse. And now watch this. We have section 6 in which we have the white horse coming back. Do you know where the four horses were? Section 2. Do you see now the connection? Because this and this are supposed to be parallel, somehow connected. Are they? Of course they are. Just like here, we saw the connection between the seven trumpets and the seven plagues. Here we have a connection between the seven seals and this moment here when the white horse comes back. Why? Because here we have the process of the history of Christianity from victory to victory throughout the centuries. Here we have the final victory, and we continue the story. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So the identification is clear, who the rider is. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now somebody may think, okay, how come there are horses in heaven? Are there horses in heaven? This is a symbol. This is a symbol of war. Why is it a symbol of war? Well, because something has not been clarified in chapter 17 and 16. We heard about the battle of Armageddon, but we never saw it happen. We were told that they were gathering up for the, the final battle at a place called Armageddon. But we never saw the battle itself happening. Now watch what is happening here. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. Strike the nations. Okay, the nations are those that are gathering together against him. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the wine press. Wine press? Huh? You see the connection? Okay. Of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and has on his tie a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. Remember, before we read about the supper of the marriage of the Lamb. This is not the same supper. This is a different kind of supper. How do I know? Look. That you may eat the flesh of 
kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So practically, the battle of Armageddon that we heard about earlier is happening here. So first Babylon falls apart, and then the battle of Armageddon happens. And the battle of Armageddon is practically the final clash between Jesus Christ coming back and those that in the sixth seal are portrayed as being those that run to the cliffs, asking for them to fall on them. So we have a picture here of the war, of the final battle, when the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So we have Babylon first destroyed, then we have the beast, and we also have the false prophet. They are taken out. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Now, we will see later what the lake of fire is. So, uh, we just keep that in mind. So, these two are already in the lake of fire. The beast and the false prophet. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. The picture is very drastic. I don't know if you've ever seen what happens when there's a corpse on the ground, like a dead animal. There's a picture in the book of Matthew, in Matthew 24, Jesus says, it's a proverb used by Jesus. He says, wherever the corpse is, there the eagles will gather. What does that mean? It's a war picture. And it's something you can vividly see now in Ukraine, for instance. When the Russian troops pulled back, and they entered to see what happened there, they found bodies on the streets decomposing. And when that happens, that's when the birds come and fill their tummy. So it's a war and the aftermaths of war. Okay, now we go on. There's another picture. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. Have we seen the bottomless pit before? Several times. The abyss, bottomless pit. We saw it in chapter 11. We saw it in chapter 17. We saw it uh, even in chapter 9, in the fifth uh, trumpet. What is specific about this bottomless pit? Who belongs to the bottomless pit? So, an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. Let's see what the angel is doing. He laid hold of the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Not only that, and he cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal on him, 
so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. So there is a thousand years during which Satan is chained, put in the bottomless pit, shut up and sealed so he could not deceive the nations till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. You may think, why is he going to be released for a little while? The text will tell us. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. We've seen these people before. You remember in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, under seal number five, they were crying, how long, O Lord? Remember that cry for justice. Again, what is interesting is, what section was that part of? Section number two. And what is this section? Section number six, which is the exact parallel section. And here, those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, let me put this thousand years here. Okay? What we have here, the beast and the false prophet, are already in the burning fire, in the lake of fire. Satan is not yet, but Satan is chained. Here we have the thousand years. After the thousand years, he will be out for a little while. In the meanwhile, during the thousand years, we are told in the text, those who were killed lived, so they are alive now, and they are where? In heaven. So here we have, let me put them uh, rather up here. So here we have the faithful in heaven. Okay? How did they become alive? Because there is a resurrection here. Resurrection number one. And there will be, we'll see later, a resurrection number two. What do these people do in heaven reigning with Jesus Christ for a thousand years? Well, one aspect is something that the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? It seems that during the thousand years, there is judgment going on in heaven, and the faithful are somehow part of that judgment process, deliberating with regard to what is going to happen to Satan and those that are not resurrected yet. Then, we have some clarification here in verse 3. But the rest of the dead, that is, those that were not resurrected in the first, did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So, here we have resurrection 2, which means that this is the resurrection of the faithful, and this is the resurrection of the wicked. This is the first resurrection, meaning those that are mentioned here, because 
that's what the text says. There is a parenthesis telling us that the rest of the dead will not live until the thousand years passes. And then it says, okay, so this is the first resurrection. And there will be this second resurrection. And this is in line with the Apostle Paul that says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Correct? If the dead in Christ rise first, then when do the dead not in Christ rise? Second. Correct? Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Again, first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Same picture that I already mentioned, faithful in heaven, reigning with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. What is the prison? The bottomless pit. So he's released and will go out to deceive the nations. How can he deceive the nations? Well, simply because they are resurrected now. If he is released here, here, and the resurrection happens at the same time, now he again has an object of activity. So he goes out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. So see how the battle, although there was an aspect of the battle right here where the horse appeared, it seems that the battle is still not over. There's a final battle again. The grapes harvest has two moments. It has a moment right when Jesus comes back, when all the wicked are killed, according to the language of uh, Revelation 19, with the sword of his mouth. And then, after they are resurrected, here, there is a final clash. They went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, namely the beloved city. What is the beloved city? That is New Jerusalem, which is the exact opposite of Babylon. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. But how could they surround the city of Jerusalem if the New Jerusalem is in heaven? Well, in chapter 21, verse 2, we are told that the holy city, New Jerusalem, comes down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So here, where Satan is released, the second resurrection happens, there's also Jerusalem coming down. So it's a perfect scenario in which the city of Jerusalem descends on earth, the wicked are resurrected, Satan gathers them together, and together they, they devise a strategy to attack the holy city. We don't know how long this time is. Then we're going on with the text, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Remember? Here the beast and the false prophet are already in fire. Now we have fire under Satan as well. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And we have one final 
picture here, the final judgment of the wicked. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So this is like a coda, a final movement, telling us that here, before this final destruction happens with fire coming from heaven, there is a judgment of the wicked, based on which they are cast into the lake of fire. Remember, we saw before lake of fire, and we said we are going to see what that means. A lake of fire, this is the second death. And I emphasize that because if you don't take this into consideration, then based on some language here in the book of Revelation, you will have the impression the lake of fire will be something that will burn eternally and will keep those that are in the lake of fire in eternal torment which is not the correct way of looking at it, because according to the definition of verse 14, the lake of fire is the second death. I believe this expression, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them, is an equivalent of the same lake of fire, which is the second death, which again points out that they were devoured. If they were devoured, you cannot picture the eternal hell of some Christians, because there are Christians, not few, quite many, that picture an eternal hell and torment, and they even use it as a method of evangelism. You better behave, you better come to the Lord, because if not, the Lord will endlessly torture you in the lake of fire. Which again is a distorted picture of the book of Revelation. So what we have here up to this point, and you will see next time uh, the final beauty here, chapter 7. What we've had up to this point, let's just review it. We have the three angels' message being preached. It's being preached already. And what we are doing tonight here is part of the three angels' message being preached. There will be a moment when grace or mercy will be no longer available because the sanctuary service is over. Now, before that, or according to some others, right after that, there will be a death decree where those that don't want to worship the beast will be sentenced to death. Again, I don't want to clarify because I don't see clarity in the Bible verse. Some say it's before this. Some say it's right after the moment when the sanctuary service ceases. There's also... In chapter 13, a moment after which those that do not worship the beast or take 
the sign of the beast on their head or head or um, hand, they will not be able to sell or buy. You know that from Revelation 13. So that seems to be prior to the death decree or at the same time, somehow. Then after the sanctuary service ceases, the seven plagues are poured out. In the succession of the seven plagues, Babylon, which is a false religious system that Christianity has become over the centuries, falls apart. Babylon falls. We have the angel in chapter 18 calling out loud, fallen, fallen is Babylon. And we have the lament of the kings of the earth, of the merchants of the earth, of those that did prostitution, so to speak, with Babylon. They are all crying because all their benefits, because this was a relationship with benefits, all their benefits are gone. So Babylon falls, the way is open for the kings of the east, led by Jesus Christ himself on white horse, because he is followed by others on white horse. He appears and what is called the Armageddon battle happens, which is the final clash. As a result of that, those that run to the cliffs so they can fall on them, the text says, they are killed by the sword of his mouth, whatever that means. Fact is, when the thousand years start, Satan is bound, he's locked up in the pit, which, among other things, also means that there's nobody he can really deceive until the thousand years pass. Why? Because only after the thousand years are gone, the wicked are resurrected, so he again has somebody to deceive. Now, in the meanwhile, this guy, the prince riding the white horse, takes the bride home. So the bride, obviously, is in heaven. While the wicked on the earth have become the prey of the birds. So they are gone until this moment of the second resurrection. When Satan is released, now again he has people to deceive. Jerusalem, where the faithful are, because Jerusalem is the residency of the faithful during the thousand years. Jerusalem descends, let me say from here, okay? And these people surround or gather up against the city of Jerusalem to attack the city. And that's when from heaven fire comes down. And we'll see next time because there's some more happening here. Because our final destination is not heaven. So we are still missing a segment. So this pop culture Christianity, where all I want is to make it to heaven, is not really biblical. Because our final destination is not heaven. That's a temporary city break, if you want. After this whole thing here, there's new earth and new heaven, but that is for next time. Complicated? Not that complicated. You know, when I was a child, I was six, around six years old, and that's when I remember the first bride I've ever seen. 
when I was six. And that bride was so beautiful. She was just amazing. Funny thing is, I know that lady. I still know that lady. She is probably like 15 plus years older than me. I've never seen her that beautiful after that. <laughs> but not that she is not beautiful now. But she was, she was extremely beautiful when I saw, I did not know her before, or at least I don't remember. All I have in my memory as a six-year-old is that picture of a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful bride. Now, what made that situation so critical that it stayed with me, and I will never forget is, my dilemma as a six-year-old, and my question, because next to her, there was a guy that I saw ugly. <laughs> he was so ugly. That's, that's how the six-year-olds saw him. So, so my question was, how can this beautiful bride marry that ugly groom? Okay, let me flip the picture a little bit. This is just an illustration. It's a real story, but it's just an illustration. When I see the beauty of the groom, because the description of chapter 19 of the groom is a beautiful picture. We don't have a description of the bride. All we know about the bride is she didn't even have a bride dress. It was granted to her. She didn't have. So then the question would be, how can such a beautiful groom marry such a poor bride? And to that, I believe the only answer is grace. Because by grace, we are granted that beautiful dress of fine linen, which is the good works of the saints. Because those good works are prepared by Jesus Christ in advance, and he creates us. He's the one that prepares us. Because while he is preparing the place home in the Father's house, he's also working on the preparation of the bride. Isn't that a beautiful love story? Questions? So the question is, isn't the fine linen the righteousness of Christ? Because it sounds as if it is the woman, the bride, that prepares herself. In verse 7, 19 verse 7, this is what it says. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. If you stop reading here, then indeed it comes across as if she prepared herself she had the money for a nice wedding dress, went to do the dress rehearsal. Uh, she has everything put on. She prepared herself. But the text doesn't end there. The text continues, and in verse 8, here, this is what it says. And to her it was granted. And this is what clarifies that the dress is not her. She was granted. Yes, she had to put it on. Because nobody can force it upon you. And the righteousness of God, or the righteousness of Christ, 
functions like that. Nobody pushes it, nobody forces it on us. We have to put it on. But it is granted to us, and the fine linen, the clean and bright linen, is the righteous acts of the saints, which again, biblically, the righteous acts of the saints are not acts made of and in themselves by the saints. They are done by Jesus Christ living in them. I don't necessarily see chronology. I, I see what you are saying. So you are suggesting that you have her put on the dress she is given and then the righteous acts follow. I'm not sure the text allows for that chronology because you are saying you put on the righteousness of Christ, which is the robe of righteousness or the fine linen of righteousness. And as a result, you are going to do the righteous acts of the saints. The fine linen, it says, are or is the righteous acts of the saints, which means you don't have this relationship that out of this results this. The relationship is this. This equals this, according to the text. That's a very good observation. You have the succession of the overcomers. Seven messages or seven promises to the overcomers throughout the history of Christianity. But there's one more time when there is he who overcomes. Do you know where it is? Let me give you a hint. So the suite of overcomers is here. Where would you expect the final message of over overcomer to happen? It's exactly here. So again, that supports the same theory that this is a chiastic structure. So what you are saying is that uh, in that suite of overcoming message, it sounds like that is our part, that is our victory. We are part of it. Now the question is, how much are we the source of that victory? You know why I'm asking that? Because in this section here, the first picture of the guy going out, riding the white horse, is somebody that uh, goes out victorious or having overcome already and to overcome again. Please look in chapter 6, I think is verse 2. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Conquering and to conquer. So the Greek text says this. He who goes out on the white horse, the one riding the white horse, is already conqueror, which reminds of the cross. Okay? And goes out to conquer. So this, all this here is a process of conquering up to the final conquest. So then, throughout this history, you and I are given the promise of the conqueror, he who overcomes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But the question is, if he is the victorious that goes out to win again and again and again, who is winning here? Is it my victory or is it his victory? And I think the correct answer is, he obtains victory in me, which becomes my victory. But 
I don't feel comfortable about uh, assuming that I am the victorious. It is Him victorious in me and me victorious in Him. It's His power that ob obtains the victory. I obtain victory through His power. So that's, I think, the theological way of reasoning it out. Yeah. Good question. So can we compare the horse, the white horse in Revelation 6 to the white horse in Revelation 19? Let me bring the chiastic structure back. If you read the description of the white horse in verse 2, this is what it says. And I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow. And a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So the picture is the white horse goes out. The observation you're making is that when you see the white horse in chapter 19, the white horse seems to be coming from heaven. So then the question is, can we still say that this horse that goes out here is the same horse that comes in here? I believe yes. I believe the mere fact that here it comes from heaven should not necessarily give us the impression that this horse runs on terrain, on ground, and then there's another horse that comes from above. Why? Because in the description that we have here, we have the earthly aspect of uh, moving from victory to victory throughout the history of Christianity. Because Jesus, if he is the rider of the white horse, after the cross he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So his victory has two components, a heavenly component and an earthly component. So practically what we see here is the earthly component of uh, him being victorious or moving from victory to victory throughout the seven stages of the history of Christianity because this is what we have here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And here, when he appears, he comes with the heavenly authority because he's followed by the hosts of heaven. Now, when it comes to the identification of who are those that follow him, there are two theories. Some people say, that he is coming followed by the angels. Which I think is biblical. question is, does it square with the text here? Because the text says that those that follow the one riding the white horse are clothed in fine linen themselves. So then the question is, do the angels have the same kind of garment of righteousness that we receive, don't they have a different kind of experience? Meaning the good angels, the faithful angels. So that's one theory. The other theory is that uh, it's not the angels. When Jesus comes victorious for the final battle, he is being followed on white horses by the 144,000. It's it's the 144,000 led by the Lamb, the same picture that you can see in chapter 14 after the battle when you see the Lamb on Mount Zion and with Him the 144,000. So from that picture, some people say, well, it has to be that the rider of the white horse is followed not by angels, meaning heavenly beings, Although they come from heaven, they are actually the 144,000 that enter the final 
battle of Armageddon, from which they come, victor come out victorious, according to chapter 7 of the book of Revelation, in which, in chapter 7, you have two moments. One before the battle, when they are lined up as soldiers by the thousands, and there are 144,000, that's the number of them, whatever that means. And then when they come out of the great tribulation, when you cannot count them because now they are scattered, they, they have been in the battle. Then the question is, if that's the correct explanation, the question is, how come the 144,000 who are earthly people, how come they are coming from heaven following the white horse rider who is coming from heaven? And there is a sound explanation, possible explanation for that, because in several places in the New Testament, we are called citizens of heaven. So some would say, that's why the final picture of the white horse coming for the final victory, followed by those in fine linen, is a picture of the saints, of the bride, actually, that comes with Jesus Christ. And they are pictured as coming from heaven because they are citizens of heaven. To me, it seems more plausible to see the picture of Jesus being followed by angels, by heavenly beings, because I have plenty of Bible verses that speak about that, that Jesus, when he comes back, is followed by his angels or the angels of his father. So the question is, could it be that they are angels, those that are following the white horse and its rider, they are angels, and they are clothed in fine linen because they had overcome some sort of... Um, temptation or battle before? It sounds very tempting to say yes. Knowing from the Bible, from some pictures in the Bible, that before the great controversy was moved or moved to our earth, there has been already battle happening in heaven. So, because we don't know too much about that history. Although what you are saying sounds very plausible to my mind, my answer has to be I don't know, because I don't have information. But logically, I think it carries water. Because if there was war in heaven, something similar to the plan of salvation that God put in place for human beings must have been put in place for those heavenly beings before it even expanded to us. But we don't have too much biblical information with regard to what happened and how, if in any way, this uh, white linen picture of... Uh, Christ's righteousness applies to them. But again, I'm not excluding the possibility. I think it's, it's a very insightful uh, thought. So Revelation 19, 12 says, He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Later on, in verse 17, if I'm not wrong, no, 16, it says, And he has on his robe and on his tie a name written. So in both contexts, the name is written. And here it says, King of kings and Lord of lords. Same picture appears in chapter 17 as well. Then you said there is uh, that verse in the suite of the seven churches, practically, where 
the one that overcomes will receive a new name. Is there any connection between this name or these names and that name? I believe yes, because we have plenty of evidence biblically that a name and a new name is identity and a new identity respectively. The story of Jacob becoming Israel and um, taking on some new identity features is a good background story for the human that becomes victorious and therefore becomes a new being, puts on a new identity and receives a new name. So when it comes to a human being receiving a new name, that new name has to do with his or her new identity in Jesus Christ or connected to Jesus Christ. But in 19 verse 12, with regard to that name that nobody knew but him, I still don't know what that name is or was because only he knew. Yes. 20 verse 13 the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. The question is, how is this judgment being done according to somebody's works? Because somebody can do things knowingly, willingly, intentionally. But the truth is sometimes you may do things that you don't even want to do. There is this biblical picture of uh, somebody that killed somebody unwillingly that runs and hides in that uh, refuge city because they had a special refuge city for those, for instance, if you were cutting wood and your ex flew off your handle and hit somebody's head and the guy was gone, then what? Because normally, biblically, if you took a life, your life is taken. But God provides for a situation where somebody is not really responsible for something accidental, for something that is beyond the control power of that human being. I think the same principle applies here too. Now, these, this section of the judgment applies to the people that are dead during the thousand years, and are resurrected here in the second resurrection. So if their works had been judged as uh, not being imputable to them, they should have been here in heaven to the first resurrection or never see death being part of the 144,000. But since they are not in heaven during the thousand years, here they are resurrected. And at that time, it is obvious that the works based on which they are judged are imputable to them. So they are responsible for the works that they have done. But your question is very good because... I don't believe the Bible teaches that judgment is done based on work without taking in account special circumstances or attenuating circumstances. Because according to the Bible, for instance, you can read uh, Acts chapter 17, and it's pretty clear that God winks when it comes to the time of somebody being ignorant, not willingly ignorant, but ignorant because nobody told me. I had no way to 
get to know something. So in that sense, I don't think here somebody will be judged based on works that he or she would not be responsible for. So the question is this. If the woman becomes a harlot in the wilderness or after the wilderness, how come at the beginning of the wilderness, which is the beginning of the 1260 years, she is already a harlot. So that's, that's the tension. Okay, let me draw the line first and then try to give uh, some input on that. So here we have the history of Christianity from the cross to the second coming. Okay? And here somewhere we have a bracket of time called 1260 or 42. Or the wilderness. This, this time here is the wilderness. We don't know exactly, based on the text, when the woman in the wilderness became the lover of the beast. Fact is, at one point, she is riding the beast. So it's the woman on the beast. But the question is, when the whole wilderness experience started, wasn't it the woman doing the persecution, meaning a corrupt church system doing the persecution of the saints? And the answer to that is yes. But historically, I believe, it is sustainable that throughout the wilderness period or the Middle Ages or dark Middle Ages, when uh, the faithful believers of Christ were persecuted by the church, by the Christian church, it was mainly the political side the beastly side of that power that were, was doing the persecution. Because from the beginning of the existence of uh, that beastly power, we have not only a religious power, but also a political power. Now, this is what I see in the story of the seven churches. In the so story of the seven churches, we have this uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Up to the middle section here, the majority is faithful. The minority is unfaithful. Here in the middle, because that's how maths work, the percentages, here in the middle, from this point on, the majority unfaithful and the minority faithful, which is the remnant, the concept of the remnant. You only have a remnant when it's less than half. Okay? So practically, here, up to, up to somewhere here, the majority of the women were still faithful. But you already had a minority of the women that was so to speak, riding the beast, even from the beginning here. But it's not the full woman. That's how I see it. Because of the percentages. Based on the seven churches, you can clearly see that around the middle, which is the fourth segment, that's when the percentages change. Which pretty much overlap with this time period. If that makes sense. Lord, we thank you so much for the study we had together. Yes, there are complicated things, but at least we can see light at the end, and we can see that everything turns into something bright and beautiful for those that are part of your bride. 
we pray, Lord, that uh, you will clothe each one of us in that fine linen of uh, Christ's righteousness. Because in his name, we pray through the Holy Spirit. Amen.